All right, so my computer wanted a little bit of break there. I think we, I think we fixed the slowdown issue. So again, I go back to to my my stuff here. So what did I call this guy? I called this guy the canonical form, canonical form of a first order system. And I said the more general form, more general form, would be a over tau s plus one. Okay, where I call this term here, I sometimes call it the DC gain. In other words, it's the value of the transfer function if s equals zero, and s equals zero um, corresponds to DC, right? Low frequency. Okay. All right, so that canonical form there, I'm going to study that guy. In general, what I said is previously, my real world, as I like to refer to it, is the time domain. Okay, in other words, typically what I'm really interested in is what does C of T look like, right? For this system, a system with this 1 over tau s plus 1, like I said, which might be an RC circuit, that guy is going to have a, trans or a differential equation that looks like this. Okay, the input is equal to the output plus a term related to the rate of change of the output. Okay, so what I see is in steady state, R of t is going to equal C of t. Okay. In steady state, R of t is equal to C of t. So in other words, in steady state, the derivative term is gone. Okay. Or the way I look at this in the Laplace domain is I say, well, as t goes to infinity, it's sort of the same as s goes to zero. So if I look at this guy right here, if s goes to zero, this thing becomes a gain of one, and output equals input. As t goes to infinity, this derivative goes away, r of t equals c of t, same thing, okay? So something to kind of think about, all right, a little bit. That's why we use that term kind of dc gain, okay? If, if this, if I was looking at the differential equation that goes with this guy, then both terms would have uh, sort of a gain applied, okay? Actually, it would be in that case, it would be this. Okay. That way, when I see that when uh, the the derivative is dead, the transient response is over. C of t equals a times r of t. Okay. All right. Okay. So. This concept is really the key concept, solving the differential equation. All right, nobody wants to do that. What we want to do is we want to take the, the Laplace transforms of the input, Laplace transform the transfer function, inverse Laplace that. Okay, that's what I want to do. I'm going to do that here. Let's say I want to first look at what I call the natural response. All right, the natural response. That guy for me is what is often called the impulse response. Okay. Meaning if I give the system a little kick and I let R of T equal delta of T, meaning that R of S equals one, what will C of S be? Well, C of S in this case is one over one plus s tau, or the way I rewrite that guy is I say one over tau over s plus one over tau. Okay, other than the fact that I have a crazy line there. Okay, those two things are equivalent. And you should see that's because I multiply top and bottom by one over tau. Okay, this guy can be inverse Laplace transformed. You can look that up in the table. So by inverse Laplace, I see that C of t equals one over tau e to the negative t over tau. Okay, so let's look at that guy, okay? 
here's what that impulse response impulse response here's what he looks like okay he is c of t equal to one over tau e to the negative t over tau and the thing i always leave out and i really shouldn't why does that t over tau u of t okay i always leave out this u of t technically this this thing because I applied an input at time t equal to zero, the output doesn't begin until time t equal to zero. So I really should have that u of t in there. Okay. Come back to those slides. All right, so my impulse response looks like this. So what I get is this decaying exponential, okay, exactly like we've, we've sort of talked about. And it starts at one over tau. So if I look at t equal to zero, this guy should be equal to one over tau. You should be able to see that. And then he falls. Okay. Now a couple of important things that we kind of define. All right. So once we've reached one time constant, what we see is that at t equal to tau, all right? What I see is that c of tau, all right, the value there is 37% of C zero, all right. He's fallen by he's fallen basically by sixty three percent. Okay, so in other words, the the important thing is I've changed sixty I've dropped sixty three percent from where I started. All right, in one time constant I fall that much. Okay, so we're going to define a couple of a couple of things here later on in a second. But that's some some important stuff. Now impulse impulse response we don't talk about as much probably is the step response. Okay, so let me go to here, okay, and here's my system, okay. The more useful thing very often to talk about is a step response, meaning that R of F is one over F, so R of T is equal to u of t, meaning that I have a function that is 0 up until time t equal to 0, and then use 1 thereafter. Okay. In that case, phi Laplace transform, r of s, has a pole. The input has a pole, right? We never talk about poles of the input, but the input has a pole. We don't talk about poles of the input because poles of the inputs don't control stability. Poles of the system control stability. Okay, all right, so enough about that. So if I want to figure out what C of T looks like, so our goal is to figure out C of T. Again, we could do the differential equation. Nobody wants to do that. So what we say is that C of S equals, in this case, one over S times one over tau S plus one. Okay, so, if I wanted to figure out what C of T is, again, I got to do my partial fractions, okay? And if I, if I go through that process and try to do um, my partial fractions, what I ultimately find, all right, typically before I even do it, I factor this guy again the same way I did before, one over tau, S plus one over tau. You should be able to see that those are completely equivalent, all right? Do my partial fractions, and I say I've got k1, so s plus 1 over tau, k2 over s. So again, what I see is I've got a pole arising from the input, a pole arising from the system, okay? And this guy ultimately gives me the steady state component. This guy ultimately gives me the transient component, okay? What I find from this whole thing, if I go through and I solve this for that type of input, then what I ultimately get out of this, when I inverse Laplace this guy, is I get uh, negative 1 over s plus 1 over tau 
plus one over f. Okay, you should be able to figure out how to get those things. If I inverse Laplace that, I get c of t equal to u of t times 1 minus e to the negative t over tau. Okay, as I like to write that, maybe more so u of t minus e to the negative t over tau u of t. This is the steady state. This is the transient. In other words, this guy is going to die away and disappear eventually. And all I'll be left with is output equals input. Okay? So you should be able to see that in many different ways, that output equals input and steady state. Okay? All right. So um, how do I look at what that looks like? So back over to my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, back over to my PowerPoint here. So I see that my step response, we call it, looks like this. This is my step response. Okay, I get this. Okay, so a um, couple of important things that I've defined here at C of tau. So when t equals tau. So once tau seconds have elapsed, okay, this thing is equal to 1 minus e to the negative 1, or e becomes approximately 0 0.632. In other words, at that time, at t equal to tau, C of tau is equal to 63% of C final. Right? It is 63% of its final value at that point. Okay. <clears throat> so that's kind of an important, an important factor. Okay, so in this particular case, I'm saying he's 63% of one. Okay, if instead this guy was 2, this guy would be 2 times 0.632, okay? He would be 63% of 2, whatever that would be. I guess it would be about 1.26 or something like that, okay? So it's something to bear in mind. At, at t equal to tau, I'm at 63% of my final value, okay? Now, back to my original premise here. When I talk about this system, which I guess I've sort of deleted here. No, here it is, all right? When I talk about this particular system that I created, or any control system that I have, when I build that control system, what I said is I take a system that had a particular pole, and I change that pole, okay? I move it, right? The fact that I moved it was what made me be concerned about stability in the first place, all right? Well, why do I hearken back to that point? The reason I kind of hearken back to that point is because <clears throat> in controls, we're changing the transient response of the system. And if I am changing the transient response of the system, what that means is I probably want some way of quantifying that change. Okay? So in other words, I want to know what is the, what is the new tau of that system. Okay? Well, very often the way that we talk about about that stuff is in the context of some key performance indicators okay so i can talk about a couple of things i talk about rise time and i talk about rise time and settling time okay and we have some common definitions for these two things. Basically, these are the specifications that we tend to usually provide when we're designing a control system. Again, because we're moving the tau when we, when we put a control system in place, what we typically say is, well, here's how fast I want the response of that system to rise to a step. 
Here's how quickly I want it to settle to a step. All right, so these things have definition. The rise time is how long it takes to go from 10% of final value, 10% of final to 90%, okay? Settling time typically is the time to 2% from final. It's like it's the time to 98%, okay? I call this guy TR. I call this guy TS, okay? So rise time is defined as how long it takes to get from 10% of the final value to 90%. Okay, so here's another picture of this guy. So at tau, I'm at 63% of my, of my final value. And here I've shown that rise time. So the amount of time it takes to get from 10% of the final to 90% of the final. That's my rise time. And the amount of time it takes to get from zero to, in this case, 2% from final, right? Or 98% overall. That is my settling time, okay? So T rise, okay? This is not an exact formula, but it's approximately true. T rise is approximately 2.2 tau. In other words, to get from 10% to 90%, it takes about 2.2 time constant. We're gonna use that later on, okay? We're gonna use that uh, in, in our first design problem. The settling time is, we typically say approximately four tau, not exactly that, but in approximately four time constants, we settled to within 2% uh, of, of our final value, okay? All right, so those are, those are some key things that we will use uh, a little bit throughout the semester. Now in your lecture notes, or I talk a little bit more also about the uh, what we call the uh, ramp response, all right, which is basically to say if my input was a ramp, what's the output look like? I'm not going to talk about that here. You guys can, can read about that. Uh, we'll talk about it later on in the semester. All right. What I want to do, though, before I end, I want to go back to this picture here, 1 over tau s plus 1, our basic guy, right? We just talked all kinds about the, about the, the response uh, in the time domain for steps and impulses and things like that. But I want to quickly say, how do I view this thing in the complex plane? In other words, S, when I'm looking at Laplace transforms, S is a complex number, okay? In other words, S is equal to a real part, a real part plus an imaginary part, okay? You guys are used to saying S equals J omega, okay? This has a special assumption, okay? I will ask you some questions about that in the homework. You guys use that all the time. This makes a special assumption, okay? It makes the assumption that I'm dealing only with sine waves. In general, this is true. S is a complex number, okay? So what that means is that if I look at this guy, G of S equal one over tau S plus one, well, that's really meaning that this guy is tau times sigma plus J omega plus one, okay? So this guy is really a pretty complicated function. That means that this guy, the other way I can think of him is that he has a magnitude and he has an angle, okay? So if I looked at the magnitude of this G of S, let's think about that for a second. The magnitude of G of S, is equal to 
if I had to, to go through that, it's equal to the magnitude of this guy down here. So what would that be? Well, that would be complicated, right? Looks like what I have is a real part squared on the bottom. Okay, plus tau omega squared. Okay, so I'm going to look at the example. Let's say my tau equals 0 0.1 seconds. Okay, that turns this guy into, okay, tau is a number, so tau is 0 0.1, tau is 0 0.1. Basically, what that says is that this guy, this magnitude, is a three-dimensional function, right? In other words, he is a function of two variables. He's a function of the real part of s and the imaginary part of s, okay? I can graph this, okay? So I can graph this over a range of sigma and a range of omega. The magnitude would be in the third dimension, okay? That's what I've had drawn on this next slide. So here I have 1 over 0.1s plus 1. Okay, So what I see, you guys know that there's a pole at s equal minus 10. Okay, So what I can see here is what I plotted, I guess, is this is the magnitude of h of s. This is the, so my x-axis here, this is the real part. My y-axis here, this is the imaginary part, okay? So what I see is that this blue meshy thing is the magnitude of h of s, okay? For any combination of sigma and j omega, the real part of s and the imaginary part of s, right? What I have shown here is how that magnitude varies as a function of those two things. So what I see is that when the imaginary part is 0 and the real part is negative 10, right? So at that intersection there, right? At that intersection, I see this guy's got like a big cone. I've cut this off. Technically, what I'd see is that this guy is headed up towards infinity, and thus what I have is a pole. Okay, so this is really what that Laplace transform looks like. Now we're going to look at that a little bit more and relate this to the Bode plot, because there's a more intuitive way to sort of think about these transfer functions and the way that they relate to the Bode plot, which we'll kind of get to. Okay, but what I can clearly see is that the magnitude of h of s goes off to infinity in this sort of three-dimensional plane. Now, we don't typically draw this picture. The picture we draw is usually our pole zero diagram, which looks like this, which basically, you know, I put an X here to, to imply that there is a pole. Basically, there would be a stick, a pole, literally shooting up in the third, in the third dimension. Right? That's the only reason why I kind of show this picture. Why do we say pole? Basically, because I can think of there being a big pole right here, and I can think of that Laplace transform magnitude as basically being a, a sort of a canvas that I kind of dropped on top of that pole, okay? And it's sort of draped down and sort of slowly decreasing towards, towards zero as I move away from that pole, okay? So sort of a tent pole is sort of where the term uh, kind of comes from, all right? So we draw that pole zero diagram. So I just wanted to kind of refresh that. We're gonna relate that all to the Bode plot and to the frequency domain later. Important thing is that Bode plot implies that I'm talking about sinusoids. Not that I'm talking about sort of the more general case. All right, Laplace transforms talk about the more general case. We're going to talk about that in a lot more detail, but I wanted to relate that because I wanted to talk about this pole zero picture and relate that pole zero picture back to the back to the transfer function. But I think it's important to understand that that little perspective about what a pole is first. All right, we'll talk about that a little bit more later.